London news agents. In the midst of the agony of the Israel Gaza conflict, there is a question that is both pressing and urgent for the British government, and it's this Have government ministers ignored the legal advice which says that Israel is in breach of international humanitarian law and therefore there should be no arms sales from the UK? to Israel. Well, that is the charge made today by one parliamentarian who this morning referred David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, and Kemi Badenoch, the Business Secretary, to the government's ethic advisor to ask if the ministerial code has been breached. The MP in question is the only MP in Parliament of Palestinian heritage, Leila Moran. And four months ago, she came on this podcast and talked about the agony of trying to get her family out. Last night, they managed it. We had the news overnight that they are now landed in Bahrain. They are safe. We've got them out. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And today we're going to hear an extraordinarily personal story. And it is of the family of Leila Moran, her third cousins, five members of her family, who have for four months lived under the constant bombardment in Gaza and have been trying to find a way out. Leila is very honest about the help that she has had to give them to make it possible. And she's very conscious that they're just one family in the midst of two million who cannot get out of Gaza. But today, exclusively, she talks to the news agents about how it happened and where she thinks this war is now going. Yeah, there are two questions, obviously. One is the deeply personal and the other is the political. And she has very firm views, not just on what is unfolding in Israel and Gaza, but also the role that the British government is playing or not playing or stubbornly refusing to do and what the Liberal Democrats are trying to do to achieve some kind of shift in government thinking and policy. She asks, essentially, whether we have become complicit by willfully ignoring legal advice that she believes the government has already been given that would say Israel is breaking international law. If that advice has been given and we continue to sell arms, then we are also in breach of the law. Well, I spoke to Leila Moran a little while ago about the state of the conflict and she's come back on today. And one of the reasons she's decided to speak to us today is because overnight the Oxford West and Abingdon MP got family news. And Leila, we spoke at length on the news agents kind of seems like an eternity ago, but probably three or four months ago about the situation. And you had your family in Gaza and it was hair raising and scary and you didn't know what was going to happen next. I gather you have news. We do. Um, and it's bittersweet news. But the sweet part of it is we've got them out, which I just I still can't quite believe. So we've been trying and trying. They have um, immediate family who live in Bahrain who had issued them all visas. But it's taken the best part of four months to sort out the permissions, the paperwork. You have to coordinate between the Israelis, the Egyptians, the Bahrainis, who's going to meet them. And then we had that sort of breakthrough where we found out that the visas and the permissions had been granted, but they then had to make that treacherous journey from Gaza City through the checkpoints, Lord knows how, to Rafa and cross and there are nightmarish stories before they even began so we had the news overnight that they are now landed in bahrain they are safe and boy the bitter bit is i wish i could do this for the other two million people who were there i wish we could casework every single one and and you know get them all out it's also bittersweet because the story of the palestinian people is people leaving in situations like this and not being able to return. Um, as I mentioned to you, John, one of their houses had been bombed in the initial week uh, by the IDF. That's why they fled to the church. The other house uh, where the parents and the young children were, they they did manage uh, one day when it was quiet to go and have a look and it was burnt out from the inside out. Everything that belongs to those poor 11 year old boys, their toys, the whole thing, gone. 
Um, so what are they going to come back to one day if they're ever going to come back? But look, for now, they're safe. And I don't have to worry about that. But I do know that this wouldn't have happened, frankly, without my intervention. And not everyone has an MP for a relative. And I, I we just have to do everything we can to make it safe for the everyone else there. And the only way to do that is that immediate bilateral ceasefire that we have now been calling on for months and months and months. They shouldn't have had to leave. And that's the point. Lely, you make a, um, a, a much bigger point there and we'll come on to that. But just to try and understand what you're going through right now and what they're going through. Have you spoken to them? Do you know how the journey was? Do you know which cross points they used? Because when you look at the map, it's almost it's impossible to see how that happened. I've not spoken to them directly. We're having a Zoom in the next 48 hours, but they need to sleep. And by all accounts, they are traumatised. It's my cousin, who is the daughter of uh, the eldest one there, who I've been speaking to, the one in Bahrain. Uh, we were having sort of as best we could blow by blows of the journey. Um, it started with a bus. Uh, and, and I just still find it unbelievable that there are any operational vehicles in Gaza at all. But yeah. the, the church has a bus that took them to the sea road, which is the main road that goes from north to south. The most dangerous bit of the crossing uh, was the checkpoint that's halfway down the sea road. Um, and apparently when they were there, uh, there was shooting. Guards were shooting at some people in the crowd. No one was shot, but they dispersed. Um, the family refused to leave. They said, let us cross. We want to cross. The crossing then closed for a number of hours. It then opened again. Next, we heard they were in another vehicle making their way down to Rafa. I mean, these are tiny distances, yeah. but in order to get to the vehicle, the hardest bit physically for them was walking across sand and rubble for a couple of hours. And um, the eldest of them in her 70s, she's not been well and has is, is always had mobility problems. It was one of the reasons they couldn't just flee in the first place. So her walking across that treacherous part was apparently very, very difficult. And, and we were all worried they would get there. And then they got to Rafa and apparently Rafa was shut. Um, and the way they described it was that it was both a, a treacherous journey, but also a day of miracles is the way they saw it. Um, the next I heard was when they were safely received on the other end uh, by the Bahraini embassy in Cairo. They stayed in Cairo overnight one night and then they flew the following day. And right now they are safe in Bahrain. And do you know how long the whole journey took? Um, they started at the crack of dawn. They didn't get across until well into the afternoon. Um, and at each point along the way, you know, each bit sort of takes a couple of hours. But bear in mind, you know, in normal times, you can drive the length of Gaza in much less than an hour. I mean, it's a, it's a tiny piece of land. Yeah. Um, the difficulty was the checkpoints all along. And the other thing I'm struck by that you said is just how many permissions you had to get, how long it all took. And here are you, a perfectly connected member of parliament, knows how to get things done, knows which corners can be cut, and yet it still took you four months. Yeah, yeah. And and they're not the only ones that, you know, in parliament collectively we're trying to help. There are injured children who are in hospitals that we're struggling to help get out. We also know of families who have had to pay extortionate amounts of money, upwards of the uh, figure of sort of 10, 20,000 US dollars to get a, a family out. So there is a huge amount of paperwork, bureaucracy, frankly, a bit of corruption thrown in there. It, it's awful trying to get people out. And that's if they are willing to even get to Rafa in the first place. The reason they left this time was because the assault on Shifa hospital had stopped their thinking was that, well, that stopped. This is our moment and we've got to grab it because they had been waiting for a ceasefire. I mean, this is yeah. for a month. They've been waiting for a ceasefire truce, even a day, so that they could feel safer crossing with the elderly relative and the children. And it just didn't come. So, I mean, it really was a case of we feel that we've got nothing else here for us now. We're going to we know this could kill us, but we're going to go. And and as you say, I mean, they have, they've been lucky throughout compared to others. They, they've had a roof over their head. Uh, they've had the attention of the world on them because of what happened over Christmas and the snipers that were firing into the compound. You know, the, the Pope himself intervened. They've had the, the eyes of the world on them. 
and in part they've been really lucky but all i can think of now is is all the people still there you know and and also the fact that we are now in a situation where brits have been caught up in this uh, what is happening there i think people are now seeing this isn't a normal war it's it never was but i think people have have now realized with the death of the three british aid workers you know this isn't being conducted in a way that we would recognize as being right and it seems like the legal advice is there to suggest that and uh just this morning i've referred kemi badenock and david cameron to the ethics advisor because if it is found out as alicia kearns who's the chair of the foreign affairs select committee that international humanitarian law has been broken that they have received that advice and you might remember john when i came on your program i sent I was calling for that advice and that that was the main thing we were asking for three or four months ago if they have known this they should have already stopped any kind of arms trade with israel and if they haven't then it's possible they've also broken the ministerial code because the code says they must abide by the law which what makes is, the publication of the legal advice presumably so important so important so so what is the process now you've taken this to the ethics committee and they now decide whether there has been a breach of the ministerial code of conduct sure yeah, so it's the ethics advisor uh, who looks at the ministerial code of conduct. In it, there is a section that says very clearly they must comply with the law. I mean, it's it's sort of obvious. And, and, and in a way, these codes of conduct are, are designed to be obvious. But what is becoming increasingly clear and was beginning to be clear three or four months ago, but I think with various interventions, particularly from Alicia Kearns, we, we are now more sure that, than ever that they have received advice that international humanitarian law is being broken. We also started to see some of that with the International Court of Justice interim uh, measures. You know, there, there is definitely a risk of international humanitarian law being breached. And I've said all along, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but when lawyers say, and lawyers have written into the government and written out publicly saying, we believe that there have been breaches of the law, we should probably listen. And in that circumstance, it does not make sense that the government is just ignoring this and moving on. So, Leila, just it, let me get that right then. Are you saying that you believe the government willingly ignored advice that Israel had broken humanitarian law? If what Alicia Kearns says is true, which is that they have received advice to say that they are likely or have broken the law, then yes. I think the only conclusion you can come to is that the government has turned a blind eye, chosen to not heed that advice and cracked on and not done what it should have done, which is to immediately stop any arms trade with Israel. But frankly, it brings into sharp contrast the attitude that the government has taken to this conflict all along. I mean, it has been the case that Rishi Sunak has been dragged kicking and screaming to the position where they want now just a sustainable ceasefire. There are abstentions at the UN Security Council. We are seen by Israel along with America as being uh, an ally. We could have taken a much stronger stance sooner and that would have mattered. It would have mattered because bringing it right back to the humanitarian crisis, letting that aid in stopping the killing is in the interests, in my view, of Israel as much as it is to the Palestinians. And yet Britain sat on its hands. So if we are seeing now that the government has seen advice to say not only is this politically the wrong thing to do, not only is it the moral, the morally wrong thing to do, but it's also the legally wrong thing to do. I think that's something that the ethics advisor needs to be looking at. Well, do you think that we have now reached kind of the drawing firmly of a line in the sand that this has gone too far and that there does seem to be a shift from the Foreign Office about supplying arms to Israel? Certainly people are speaking out about this and you kind of wonder whether they're doing it with the support of the Foreign Office. And that actually what you've got now is the Foreign Office wanting to go further and maybe number 10 saying we'll steady. Yeah, it's it's quite possible. I mean, the it, the inertia, the lack of any movement from both the government, but also the opposition in the Labour Party on this has been staggering over the last few months. And what is clear to me is that what they're waiting on is America. 
you know, what they are carefully calibrating is what is coming out of America. Bear in mind, you know, we might be saying we want to stop arms sales and we should. The people that we should be seeking to influence right now is Biden. But also bear in mind, Biden has allowed billions of pounds worth of arms to be sold to Israel just in the last week. So this would matter, but let's be clear about who we're speaking to. Yes, it's in partners in Yahoo, but actually in reality, it's America. Um, so we have a position of influence here that we should be using. We haven't, in my view, been using it. And it's high time that we did because time is ticking. You know, we've got an American election on the horizon in November. Biden just wants to be in campaign mode and he needs pressure to do the right thing. So we, on the one hand, need to be stopping any arms trade. And, and for, just very quickly, for what it's worth, it shouldn't have taken three British white men to be killed for this to come to the fore. I do think there is a palpable shift in public opinion as a result, which is fine. But you know, we've been saying as Liberal Democrats since 2015, there should be a presumption of denial of arms trade with countries like Israel who appear on the FCDO human rights priority list because of the risk that they might be used against civilians. So I mean, we think that there's a fundamental change in policy here that needs shifting. And it's not just in the last few months we've been saying this, but I think now it's reached ahead. You're absolutely right. I mean, enough is enough is enough. It was enough four months ago. But now the idea that we are in any way complicit with any of this, I, I just don't think will wash with the British public. And I hope the government's going to listen to them. Leila, I hear your moral um, position. I wonder if you are overstating our influence either on America or indeed, you know, on the Israeli government. We we know that Netanyahu doesn't listen even to allies, doesn't listen to America. And the amount that we trade with Israel is, you know, m minuscule, relatively low in terms of what we actually export. I, I wonder whether you think this, this is, I mean, I can understand it from a moral position, but I'm not sure that we're going to change minds here, are we? I think there's several players here whose position we need to consider. You're absolutely right. Netanyahu doesn't care. <laughs> he certainly doesn't care what I say and he barely cares what the UK says at all and that much is clear. Um, in terms of who does listen to us and what difference it could make, there is a important group in Israel that Netanyahu and others do listen to and that is the Israeli street. And I, I visited Israel and Palestine just a couple of months ago and what is clear to me is that particularly the Israeli moderates, the Israeli peace camp, the people who have by and large been marginalized in Israeli politics are now finding themselves part of the mainstream again on the streets calling for Netanyahu to go. It was very clear when I was there, the effect, for example, of sanctioning Israeli extremist settlers had had. We, the UK had sanctioned four. Yeah. We've been calling for them to go further, including the extremist ministers Ben Gavir and Smotrich, for those uh, who I'm sure everyone's now familiar with this, but Israel has been building illegal settlements in the West Bank. It's having an insidious effect on the uh, ability to deliver a two-state solution. It's part of a plan that actually positively stops Palestine, Palestine from having a state at all, and that is their stated aim. And they have basically taken over the Netanyahu government. They are incredibly influential. And so the fact that Britain had started these sanctions against four Israeli settlers, these extremist settlers, was having a chilling effect. I was in Israel at the time when it was announced. It was seen as a big deal. If we did this now, that would have a big deal. And what it would do is embolden those within Israel who are trying to bring down Netanyahu, hold him to justice, and actually are on the side of an immediate bilateral ceasefire as we are, for them to go out on the streets and try harder. So I don't, I agree with you. If you look at it in very simple terms, will he listen to us? Does he care? I agree, no. But actually, are there people who will listen and be emboldened and empowered by moves like this? Absolutely. Yeah, Leila, Leila, thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. Us. Thank you. Of course, there is a big question mark, we have to say, about what this Lib Dem movement can actually achieve the sending of a letter to the ethics committee or to the government's ethics advisor, because there is a train of thought that actually any legal advice that the government, that David Cameron, Lord Cameron receives, is only ever advisory. And it could be, 
that he has seen what it says, he's taken a different view, or he's decided, even if he does believe in it, that what he wants to achieve can be better achieved without making that stuff public. Look, this is Westminster politics as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, Leila Moran set out a very big picture of the state of affairs in uh, Gaza. She's also a Liberal Democrat MP who wants to put pressure on the government. And the way they've chosen is to write this letter to the government's ethics advisor. It's not immediately apparent to me how the ethics advisor is going to rule one way or the other on this. And so it's a way of keeping up pressure. It's like it's like when you used to hear that MPs had put down a 10 minute rule bill and you say, well, OK, is it ever going to become law? No. Oh, it's just a press release by other means. And, and I suspect there is an element of that. But the questions she raises about legal advice, about whether Israel is in breach of humanitarian law, I think will resonate. And that's why I suspect that, that what Leila Moran and the Liberal Democrats are doing today will gain some traction. Yeah, uh, I've been speaking to one parliamentarian, actually from the Conservative side of things, who said the real thing you should be looking at here is the difference in approach between number 10 and the Foreign Office. I just think that, that, that you know, when you're Prime Minister, you've got a different set of people around you. You've got a wider issue. Cameron is looking at this through the foreign policy lens. He doesn't have to worry about those bigger picture issues. He is part of the toughening up approach. And, he, you know, and I think that this is one of those areas where Britain can probably be go a bit further than America because America can then say and we know that Netanyahu is speaking to Biden today mm. you know so Biden can say you know look your allies like Britain are, are already saying X Y and Z. I mean Z. Biden is actually behind Rishi Sunak on this one because we know there was this very firm conversation telephone conversation that took place between Netanyahu and our own Prime Minister on Monday night. Biden is as you say meeting Netanyahu today I mean I guess the other division is whether you talk about legal advice saying that Israel is breaking international law or whether you flip the quick the question round and say is Israel showing a commitment to international law which sounds like you know angels dancing on the head of a pin but it means that you are not actually accusing them of breaching a law you are just saying are, are you in this or are you out are you are you with this you know humanitarian international position or are you outside it? Look, there are really tough questions. And, the you know, and it's absolutely true. And Leila Moran said it in the interview that, you know, it's taken the death of three white Brits yeah. in a way to propel it to the front pages of every national newspaper. When in a we way know that, 200 or whatever. local, you know, yeah, you know Gazans. The numbers are contested. But, you know, there have been a number of aid workers. There are a number of civilians who died. And it hasn't caused that same sort of jolt of electricity uh, through the debate that these aid workers have had. And it has put Israel in a very difficult position. And Israel has an awful lot of explaining to do and will be very conscious of how much support it is hemorrhaging and continuing to hemorrhage, particularly if it's going to follow on to, uh, you know, an incursion into yeah, Rafa. I mean, when you say it's put Israel in a very difficult position, I think, you know, a lot of people will hear that and think, what, what were they thinking? Right? that nobody put Israel in a difficult position except for Israel. And we still need the full story of why these men and the others with them were chased from from one vehicle to another to another, you know, a whole sort of circus in, that, that took more than two minutes, apparently. There is an awful, horrific kind of thing that we haven't really discussed in the context of Israel, and that is the role of AI in warfare that if there is intelligence fed in to this drone with multiple warheads, that there is a Hamas fighter yeah. in their the midst. AI takes over and says, right, I'm going to destroy anything to do with that convoy. Now, that is about rules of engagement. It is about control of technology. Yeah, but they have... OK, but, you know, the flaw in the argument is they had to change convoy, they had to change vehicles three times. Yes, but they would know that the, the AI would know that this was a convoy. And the AI would know that you take out the whole and you convoy. you think that's what happened? I don't believe that Israel would have targeted aid workers like that deliberately. But I think that their rules of engagement have got lax. That, you know, the, the really tough questions for yeah, Israel exactly. are... Yeah, exactly. You don't have if to there be is deliberate. One, if you the, just have to be If there is one careless. Hamas fighter... I mean, this is my question if I had an Israel government spokesman. If they thought there was one Hamas fighter 
in those three cars... How many lives are worth losing? Exactly. Well, I think they literally have numbers on them. I mean, you know, I was listening to somebody talk about this last night. They literally have numbers of lives that you would sacrifice to get the Hamas fighter. Well, I think, there was no Hamas fighter, But I think clearly. that then the rules of engagement for the IDF have changed because I think it would have been... If there is any doubt, you le- you don't do it. Yeah. You know, if that was well, we know always that's the doubt true. of a target. We know that's not true, because look at the schools, look at the hospitals, all the rest of it. So meanwhile, there is one person, one former Home Secretary, who is completely convinced that there has been no breach of international law by Israel, and that's Suella Braverman. The suggestion itself is absurd and, frankly, an insult to Israel, who's been going above and beyond uh, the necessary requirements to ensure that civilian casualties are limited, to ensure that aid is received onto the Gaza Strip and distributed. Uh, I've seen evidence myself in terms of very up-to-date photographic evidence of plentiful food packages and trucks of uh, food, water and medicines getting to the the people of Gaza. The plentiful. Suggest- plentiful is such a totally weird, random word. How many, how many food packages or medicine packages do you have to see to know that it is plentiful and that anything you've heard about potential famine is the figment of your imagination? I mean, that's. I, I mean, I think that's quite jaw dropping. Well, it? look, you know, she's been obviously speaking very much to the Israeli side, and that is what the Israeli side is uh, going to uh, give her. Yeah, and she's there, you know, probably thinking uh, Israel needs friends at the moment because it doesn't have many, and she wants to be one of those friends in that context. It just sounds, as you say, jarring, uh, given what we understand... Oh, stop whinging. They're plentiful. Come on, go on. Well, I mean, you just listen to the aid agencies of what they're saying about the situation on the ground, and particularly now the consequence of the attack on the aid convoy, where rightly, understandably, if you are the head of a big international charity and you have a duty of care towards your staff and you're unclear about why these people were targeted and you haven't got to the bottom of it, then you're thinking we've got to pause activities. And that makes the humanitarian situation even worse and that is why this has been such a calamitous moment for Israel. Yeah I mean we know um, that already this morning World Central Kitchen has now suspended its aid operations. They've just turned round 240 tonnes of food in a cargo ship. It was destined for Gaza and it's now gone to Cyprus and that is 240 tonnes now not getting into Gaza because quite frankly they dare not put their own workers in harm's way. And this is one of the things where, you know, we have talked about the hemorrhaging of support for Israel. Why more aid can't get in more readily is a question that Israel needs to answer urgently. Because there's no shortage of food around and about. Where Suella Braverman is correct is there's plenty of food in Israel ready to go into Gaza. It's just not getting in. And, you know, and there are ports and there's the Rafa crossing and there are other crossings as well, by which food, medication. Well, fuel... when you listen to Layla, just to go back to where we started, who describes that terrifying journey that her family had done, which took pretty much all day to do what should have been less than an hour's drive. You understand why the food isn't getting through, because every single step on that journey is potentially perilous. Last word on this, uh, and David Cameron, Lord Cameron, worth saying, because because he's in the House of Lords, he can't answer MPs' questions, which MPs are furious about, that he can, they can't bring him to the Commons to hear what he's got to say. And David Cameron has done a half an hour interview, I think, with the BBC, and they've put at the bottom, uh, David Cameron refused to answer any questions about the Israel-Gaza situation. Now, I don't know what the setup was, but kind of, Emily, you and I have done enough interviews where we are bidding for interviews and you get the rules of engagement if you like and you just think really you're not going to answer a question about Israel Gaza and you are the foreign secretary and this is the most pressing issue by a million miles facing kind of the world right now Mm. Uh, yeah extraordinary I mean if you want to be generous you'd say okay he wants to not lose focus on Ukraine 
check. I understand that. And you'd also say maybe there are things going on beneath the surface that mean it's difficult for him to talk about stuff that he wants to happen in the next 24 hours. Check. Get that. But broadly, don't like red lines. Don't like red lines. What you can or cannot ask when it is, as you say, the most pressing legal, humanitarian, diplomatic, political question of the week. And if David Cameron was doing 30 other interviews over the next four or five days where you yeah. can ask him that, fine. But David Cameron doesn't do that many it's big not sit pop down. Up in the comments. He doesn't do that many sit down interviews and he's not going to pop up in the comments. Yeah. So you kind of think, well, when your main spokesman, when the Britain's representative on foreign affairs is not going to answer a question about the state of play in Israel, Gaza, you kind of think that's a bit odd. I think they'll cheeky one anyway. May do. May do. Lewis will be here tomorrow and he will be sitting down with one Ian Hislop. Yeah, it's quite a treat because we will take you through some of the finest Have I Got News For You clips, the ones you've all forgotten, and hear from Ian about his takedown of one Piers Morgan. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 